Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is artist, author, and educator Elizabeth Woody, an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Woody has published three books of poetry, Hand into Stone, Seven Hands, Seven Hearts, and Luminaries of the Humble. She received the American Book Award in 1990 and the William Stafford Memorial Award for Poetry and was a finalist for the Oregon Book Awards in 1995. Woody was named Oregon's first Native American Poet Laureate by Governor Kate Brown in March 2016. Woody leads writing workshops, lectures, and has served on multiple disciplinary art fellowship jury panels for several foundations and arts organizations nationally. She spoke at the University of Oregon on May 15, 2018 as a guest of the Native American Studies program. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Tell us about your background. Well, I, I'm a poet and I'm an author and uh, I was raised in Central Oregon. Went to school all 12 years at Madras High School, Madras School District. And when I was 13, our house burned down and we moved back onto the reservation. My grandparents had bought a house in Madras because at that time my, my mother and my auntie and my uncle were high school age and they felt busing them to school was a really, you know, long, arduous ride every day. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe eventually, attended Portland State University prior to that, and uh, went onward to graduate from the Evergreen State College and I have a master's in public administration from PSU. So tell us about how your, you journeyed to creativity and art and poetry. How did you get there? I was always creative. I was always an artist. And as a young uh, person, you know, drew volumes of books, as I called them, because they were just pictures that I would put in notebooks. And then I also had an aunt who brought me a butcher roll of, big roll of butcher paper. And I drew on this, butcher paper, long scrolls. So you can say in a certain way I was always telling stories and always being observant and paying attention to what was around me. My mother was an artist. My father uh, is an artist. I like to say he's the one who wrote the most letters and, and also was a photographer. Mm -hmm. And my uh, grandparents on both sides of my family were very, very creative, artistic persons. My grandmother on my father's side was a weaver master weaver by any by any account. If you look at her work, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather on that side of the family was um, um, a healer. He was a singer. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of say he was like a, had the PhD in American Indian knowledge and, and uh, culture. And on my mother's side, my grandmother was a master bead worker and my grandfather was an artist as well. So it was just part of our family, stories, drawing, singing, uh, of course, dancing, you know, dancing in the longhouse. So the things that I came, that came to me as a child were very much um, by example. Mm -hmm. And how did you come to poetry in particular? That's been asked a couple of times and I always tried to be uh, judicious, but I was expelled from high school. And maybe about a month or two before graduation, I had all of my required uh, subjects covered and I eventually got an honorary degree in 1994 or received one and I had been asked by the department head because I'd always been in the art department my goal was to get into uh, art school and study mm -hmm. photography mm -hmm. that's what I spent my time in high school doing and I had a kind of a pass from my teachers that if I did an A or a B or better in my coursework for the whole week they would sign me a pass to do my uh, portfolio and I would do I did that I actually did it, got a better grade than I normally would if I just sat there with no <laughs> goal. And they didn't have me pictured in the school newspaper. They vote you the most this, the most that, and you know, and it was always not pictured Elizabeth Woody, not pictured Elizabeth Woody, and the vice principal who was new and had been uh, made uh, a name for himself, expelling as many students as he could, called me into his office and expelled me. Oh, actually he expelled me and then he called me into the office and he wanted me to apologize and to go back to school one more year. Hmm. And I said I wasn't going to do that. I had my required, you know, degree. I had my requirements finished. And I did have a, um, a good school record. And so I ended up leaving and they get received a letter from the state superintendent, com you know, 
praising them for producing a fine writer like myself because I had entered a poetry contest, a writing contest, that maybe like second to the last month that the English department chair asked me to do. Mm. I wrote two poems. Never, I don't recall writing poetry before then, but friends tell me I did. Mm. And got is selected to be one of 12 Oregon high school writers. And the first one <laughs> in the program, we went to Lewis and Clark College, studied with Sandra McPherson and James Welch, mm -hmm. who's a Grovant writer of repute now. At that mm -hmm. time, he was young in his career. And that's part of the reason why I applied, was I wanted to be a, a living Native American author. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, I'd only read Mar Leslie Marmon Silco and, uh, and Scott Mamadi, both of whom I've met mm -hmm. and, and have introduced and have spent I, I'm in awe of them still. Of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> so that's how I came to poetry rather late. I was 18. I went to school. I went to the workshop. Then I went to get my GED that summer at uh, Urban Union Center in Portland. Mm -hmm. They did a battery of tests and determined that I was um, had an aptitude for uh, handwork and that I should work in a factory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't go that way. Well, that's where we, you're generally pushed. I was a very gifted person. Mm -hmm. I, I was considered, uh, I mean, the tests, my art teacher told me in my tests that he looked at my records, I was always like in the top 10 percentile in the national mm -hmm. standardized tests. I wasn't just, an, um, I wasn't a dumb Indian. I was somebody who just had a hard time in school, had a hard time with the status quo, had a hard time with, uh, I wanted to be a photographer. I chose a path that was unusual. I chose the method to build my portfolio because I didn't have my own photography studio. And so it just kind of, to me, my whole life has kind of been like that. Hmm. I get a downfall and then I get a boost and then I get a downfall and then I get a boost. Hmm. And I'm gonna stop it now because I'm towards the elder years and I'm just going to take it easy and not do the downfall. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Would you read a poem for us? I'm um, sure. This is like my most recent poem, and it's called Twanat, which is an uh, uh, Ichishkin word that's above the museum in Warm Springs. And it means to follow or to um, um, follow in the ancestral teachings and cultural life ways. And it also has a word in it called Nimipu, or the word is Nimipu, and that means the Nes Perse and Nusuch, which means salmon. Blue moonlight in swooped clouds, thin to dark eagles mating in crosses of upward elliptical loops. Beating pulses synchronize heartbeats among the Thule reed longhouses. An old wound in the land healed over years of corruption and charging horse soldiers. The children ran over the embankment. Alarms were frantic pounding of hooves and rifles. In the spirit's silent rising and cracking bones, the valley courses with Nimipu souls. At times one hears music in the leaves. It is light and tinkles of shell, rapture. Runoff torrents of moonlit ice, exhale, breathe deep. Organ pipes moan under the ribs from church. The ancestors sing despite conversion. This is not one voice, but the beginning of all voices in unison. Yes, crescendo waves of spiritual utterances of the plateau canyons. Blue herons rise. The river returns pervasive with silver and red nusuch. Thank you. I know that you have worked um, with uh, uh, EcoTrust on the um, history and protection of salmon, I know that you've been uh, that you've you've thought hard and and written about Salilo Falls. Will you tell us that's st the story of uh, Salilo Falls or um, that whole history? Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yes, I can. It's a lot of. I I think that probably the best way to start is to uh, look at the differences of how people look at the river, the Columbia River, the big river. And when um, the United States came west, it was kind of a latecomer. Mm -hmm. And it had plans to convert the land and resources into, you know, into energy, which is money. And that people were looking for land that they could get free, and that's what they got. 
So the Columbia River is a powerhouse. It, it has a drop of thousands of feet from BC Canada to the mouth. It's the basin is larger than many countries in Europe and that the uh, basin itself is supplied by all of these rivers that come from an arid landscape m predominantly, but from mountains that have a beautiful cascade, snow peaks, and it's amazing. It's, you know, it's part of the rim of fire, the Pacific Rim. So the Columbia River had a place on it called Salila Falls, which was in place, some say for 14,500 years, some people say 12,000 years, and most people say 10,000 years. And it isn't because there's a lack of, of uh, you know, um, evidence. It's just that it's political to say how long American Indian people have been here. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the longest inha continuously inhabited villages and sites in, in North America. And it also was part of a huge network that many of the U.S. highways were a part of, but a trade network. And it was a hub. And that so goods and services would come through Celilo, people fished there. It produced, you know, massive amounts of salmon that people could store and trade. You'd have enough to live through the winter, and if you were productive as a family, you had roots and you had berries also dried and ready for winter so that you could do the important work of being a family and, and, and focus on your spiritual development. So Celilo itself um, was inundated in 1957 before I was born. And it was inundated by the Dalles Dam, which is a series of dams in the Columbia River was built to essentially create a gate, a barge pathway to the Inland Empire, as it was called. And so things could come out and things could go in. And the other part of it is the Columbia River was a wild river, meaning that it, it changed course. It flooded. And there was a lot of things that happened from, from its ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the um, village itself c was a major tourist attraction. It was one of the largest, I think, falls as well in North America and was very renowned. So to remove the village and to remove the tribal peoples from the fishing sites also impacted the cultural life ways so that the sovereignty of the tribes could be challenged because the treaties with the United States is supreme law of the land. It's, in, it's enforced and upheld by the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And it's the basis for all land ownership in this region to have these treaties. So if you if you kind of weaken that system that supports that treaty or that it's ins insured by that treaty, mm -hmm. because the tribes never gave up our nationhood, we only gave up this land and we only, and we didn't give up any of the other pieces. So to soften that or to weaken that system meant that there could be dissolution of the people. The people could be disbanded um, at the whim of Congress. They could be, uh, as for some many families, because the livelihood was taken, they became impoverished and had to move and relocate to reservations. Because people would come from all these different places. They had fishing platforms. Mm -hmm. They had family systems in place. My, grand, my grandmother's family fished on Big Island, is what I understand, or Chief's Island, I can't remember, but um, so they would like cross the river and in that time with cable cars and get to the river before it was by canoe and, and just live there and catch fish. So that's what Celilo is to me, is that particular piece and the fact that my grandmother and grandparent, my grandparents fished there. My auntie, my uncle and my mom lived there, you know, a portion of the year and, you know, my there's memories there they have that are very, very essential to who they are. The smell of the sand in the sun, the sound of the, the pervasive sound of the falls, the mists, which created and generated negative eons, which are peaceful. Uh, my mom talks about how, as a little girl, her and her friends would stuff their braids up in their baseball caps and go start fights with boys from other places. <laughs> they had an ongoing feud with these guys from across the river, and they, they would Eventually, uh, they, they were discovered as girls and the guys wouldn't fight them anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their braids fell out. And my Auntie Lillian had another group of people that she, she was younger, so she wasn't a fighter like my mom. But she would love to be around all of the people. And once you stepped out of your house, you were everyone's child. Mm -hmm. So you received nurturing, you received instruction, and you received correction from everyone in that unit. And I think that probably was the most, uh, missed element besides the salmon fishing 
was the community. Mm -hmm. And there is a community there now, and they are recognized as a band, you know, the, the people who choose to live there and who are affiliated there. My grandmother's father came from Salilo. He, her ancestor was what, uh, well, mm -hmm. Yawen Schwicht, who was a treaty signer. Mm -hmm. Her father was James Thompson Watahas, and Tommy Thompson was her uncle. And my grandfather was Wasco, which he came from Cascade Locks. His mother was born in Cascade Locks. Mm -hmm. And his gra great grandmother and grandmother uh, lived in a village underneath She Who Watches across the river. We were all pretty much from a place, but there was a lot of intermixing, a lot of intermarriages. You didn't marry within one tribe like the government wants us to do under the Indian quantum, you know, that we were required to have a certain amount of Indian quantum nationhood. My nationhood was determined by the people who ruled mm -hmm. or governed. And they, if they chose, if you were a part of their community, that's what you were. But now we have this blood quantum, which is to me akin to the monarchy. Mm -hmm. Who ascends to the throne? Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. ascends to land ownership? You um, have already spoken repeatedly um, about your family members, mm -hmm. and you, they appear in your poems very often as well. Mm -hmm. You dedicate poems to them. They're, they, you write about members of your family, mm -hmm. and you write about your memories. Why is that such an important part of your creative life? Well, at this stage, or at this point in my life, and I've talked about this with another contemporary of mine that went to school at IAI with me, and he's from um, Umatilla, mm -hmm. and uh, at one time I told him, I said, who would have thought the things we witnessed as children would eventually become rare? Mm -hmm. And he said, I know, there's just certain things that kind of are very influential and very um, powerful. And the other part of it is we spend most of our time within this unit a family when we have singings, when we have healings, when we have celebrations. I mean, I lived in Portland for over 28 years, I think. And while I was there, I was kind of away from that hub of activity. In the last three years, I've moved back since my mother passed away. And I just become overwhelmed by the memory and the ancestral mm -hmm. sensibilities, as well as the animal life and the power of the land. You know, my sister and I inherited our mother's house, and we were on the front porch, and we were looking towards Mount Jefferson, which is up this valley, and all of a sudden, this big cloud came up, and I said, is that smoke? And Jolene said, no. I said, that's dust. Hmm. I said, there's a big wind coming towards us. And she said, you better get the candles out. Electricity is going to go out. So we closed the door, closed the windows, took out our candles, and the electricity went out. It hit the house. The trees, the pine trees are bending half over mm. in that wind. And of course it blew off a, shing a few shingles in our roof. But that is, to, to my memory, one of the aspects of growing up was being very much um, embedded and sensing the character of the land. Mm -hmm. And that's our long memory. Mm -hmm. You know, our ancestors reside in that memory. And our future resides in that memory, it is, is being born from that memory. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I write, because there's a bigger entity out there that humanity, most of humanity, I think, have been connected to, but many times get disconnected from. And particularly in the kind of ego-driven society that we are in now, mm -hmm. and, the and the individualism being put out on a pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you read another poem? Sure. Conversion. Changeable surface, sand, wind, brushes of grass. The composition of small particles in abalone shell is a mutable language. Fluid and clean, tonal lilting in attenuated motion. On the surface, removed from image, is an iridescent garment of compassion. Boulders are lapped in flow, voices ascend to the lunar disk. Simple paintbrush bloom, ecstatic in orange and red. Salmon pass through the river's mouth. Songs hum in the vocal throat of grace. Sagebrush around the loving fire waits in pale courage. Hold still. Touch the compact smoldering soil. The flesh of salmon is translucent as the flame. Heart 
or heat and ardor, tender interior, smoke and gum weeds. The fire is a furious matter of watching. Familiar warm air rises as the red-tailed hawk, slow and loose, a pinpoint of vision on movement. Land uplifts the shadow higher. Sun raises the cottonwood branches from the river surface. The salmon wait inside rippling light on reversal of current. The song says, come or pass, be weak or strong, dance on light. Moon is in the color of pale belly, slow turn to the sky. Scales illumine desire, loosened moon particles collect on the fringe of grass and water. A brittle sheen of calcium and light combine. The bone blends with radiance. Fine combs of supple and rigid spines rest among the stone. The root, stone, flesh, and water. Thank you. So how did it feel when you were named the Oregon Poet Laureate? What was that like? Well, it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. I've never received any kind of uh, literary award. Uh, I've never received any kind of um, mm, grant for writing before. Mm -hmm. So when I was asked, because it's, it's a nomination process, I was asked to submit, I had said no. And then the lady was a little bit confused and she said, why are you saying no? And I said, well, I, I really don't know why you want me to be Poet Laureate. And I said, she, so she sent me a letter, an email, and told me why her and her friends wanted me to be, nom why they wanted to nominate me, and be the basis of that email, I felt like I was being um, disrespectful by not accepting. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will, I'll do my part, and if we, if we, if it gets there, I'll be grateful for it, but I said, I don't really think there's a chance. I had been on the committee that had designed the program. Mm -hmm. I'd been asked as an arts advocate, advocate and as a you know working poet. And so the first person they selected after the program was in re redone was Lawson Anada. Mm -hmm. And of course, it changed a lot of things from that point on because Lawson is an amazing poet. Paul Ann Peterson is an amazing poet. Peter Sears is amazing. And I think I'm the fourth one after um, him. And we'll have another one who will certainly be amazing, but it's a service to, to the state. Mm -hmm. And when I went to write my project, I said I want to go and uh, be invited to places. I'll seek invitations and try to cultivate invitations from places that normally wouldn't be visited. Mm -hmm. Most of the literary activity is in the Willamette Valley and in the universities and school, schools. And it serves a very, very narrow band of people. Mm -hmm. So you've expanded that? I expanded my participation. And people say I was the first Native American poet. But I'd like to point out that Bill Stafford had Native American ancestry. Ah, yes. So he, did, he never bragged about it, but he said to us when we were invited to read at the Portland Poetry Festival, we were supposed to, we were scheduled to be at Powell's bookstore, and someone told us that the people in charge there said that no one would come. And there was like, we were pretty well known at that time, and myself, Ed Edmo, mm -hmm. uh, I think Diane Million, um, Philip Cash Cash, and Bill Stafford heard about it. He says, well, I have some Native American ancestry, and if they'll have me, I'll read with them. And we all said, yeah, because he's <laughs> always hung around with us, you know? And we said, of course, Bill, you can read with us, and then it was standing room only. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and thanks to Bill, probably, but I do mm -hmm. think people there came to see the whole sure. slate of us, and... Uh, I actually have a recording of that that I gave to the William Stafford Archives. Oh, cool. So can you tell us a story from your travels around the state as the Poet Laureate to one of these <laughs> lessons that you might want to share? Well, one of the things I love about Oregon, and I, I started a little kind of post series of posts on my Facebook, which is private, just among my friends, is in rural Oregon. And I will say something about rural, or, rural Oregon. And I, there's a character Characteristically, people are different in different parts of the state. Uh, they're very generous people. There are times when I've had really odd experiences, and not as poet laureate, but just being in rural Oregon. Mm -hmm. One of them being a gentleman coming over. Uh, actually, one gentleman was like digging in his car, and I came around to my car. He jumped straight up in the air, and he turned around, and he said, you snuck up on me like an Indian. 
And I said, well, I hope to shout because I am. <laughs> and then his face just fell and he says, I'm sorry. I did not mean anything by that. I said, I know. <laughs> But I was thinking of Clint Eastwood's movie where, you know, uh, Geraldine Keem snuck up behind Chief Dan George. And so I was getting a totally different hit off of it than what he was getting off mm -hmm. of it. And then another time I sprained my ankle severely at a reading down in, in Ashland. I read there twice. And I went and read, even though I was in pain, but I couldn't stand. And when I left, I could hardly walk. Mm. And this gentleman came up to me who was very slight and had a hunched shoulder and he said that he was martial artist <laughs> and I could lean on him <laughs> while I walked out and I says oh I appreciate that but I really I think I need something like a walker <laughs> and this woman appeared who was elderly and she says I have a walker you can use my walker if I can lean on the martial artist man <laughs> and I said, <laughs> so here we were this entourage going out to the car of people who are concerned about my well-being and that I made it safely and they were the sweetest people hmm that you would ever want to meet. It's hmm. a wonderful story. You are, uh, in addition to being a poet, writer, artist, and an activist, you're also a teacher of writing. Yeah. Can you say something about how you approach that effort? To how, yeah, how do you teach writing? Well, I teach also basket weaving. I've taught art, you know, bookmaking with my friend Joe. I had, I have a very different perspective on teaching writing. I taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts and I was first required to teach composition and English 101 the first two years in sophomore. And one of the things I think, and they're very well known creative writing program, I went through that creative writing program and that's a whole other story. But I said to my colleagues, I said, we can't expect every single one of these students to become superstars. I said, the literary community, the publishing industry selects who they want to serve to the public. And I said, but what we can teach them is to be powerful community members, to be great thinkers, mm -hmm. to think of things in, in ways that wouldn't be taught to them any other place. So I do like that feeling of teaching how to think in a way and teaching how to write is because they have to keep their mind active, investigate, and uh, take action. Writing is taking action. Well, on that really excellent uh, closing point. I want to thank you, Elizabeth Woody, for talking to us today. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. I've been speaking with Oregon's Poet Laureate, Elizabeth Woody, an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. She spoke at the University of Oregon on May 15th, 2018, as a guest of the Native American Studies Program. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>